Haunted Heart by Robert Harold. Teaser, fade in. Interior, a crowded parlor in 1883 Atlanta, night. Well-dressed men and women seated in rows fill most of a dimly lit room. People in the back crane necks from their seats to view a rotund female medium facing them. The fat medium slumps forward in her wooden chair. Behind her, a tall mahogany cupboard stands before a backdrop of dark curtains that stretch across the room. The medium looks up. She stares at the audience, her eyes glowing green. Her hands rise. An electrical charge dances between her palms. She slowly stands and raises her charged hands then throws her arms wide. The room erupts in a flash of light with a loud boom. The medium collapses back onto the chair. A green spectral girl materializes out of ectoplasmic mist floating above the medium's head. The spectral girl reaches out toward a bejeweled woman in black seated in the front row. Mama, help me mama, it hurts. The bejeweled woman stands, tears streaming down her face. It's her. God, it's, it's her. Her bald-headed husband puts a protective arm around his sobbing wife. The man looks at the medium. We'll pay whatever you ask. Just give our daughter peace. At that moment, the double doors in the rear burst open, and a demonic figure clad in black rags storms into the room, screaming. Fade out. End of teaser. Act one, fade in. Interior, a crowded parlor in 1883 Atlanta, moments later. After bursting into the seance, the dark figure stops to regard the audience. It is Nigel Pickford, 39, who weaves slightly and belches. His hair, beard, and ragged clothing are matted with filth. He takes a long drink from a whiskey bottle and snaps to attention. He resumes charging through the crowded room, knocking some of Atlanta's wealthiest citizens from their chairs. During the charge, he screams one word. No! Nigel bumps into the medium and she topples over. He shoves the spectral girl aside. The girl screams and rocks back and forth, arms waving and a shocked look on her face. Reaching through the black, scrim-covered opening to the cupboard, Nigel yanks out a skinny assistant, 18, who drops a green lantern. Nigel shoves him toward the audience. Next, Nigel tears down the backdrop, revealing burly assistant number one, who holds a black rope, keeping the spectral girl aloft and burly assistant number two, who is working bellows above a small stove cooking glycerin to create the mist. Nigel turns back to the shocked audience and raises his whiskey bottle in triumph. With his other hand, he gestures to the hapless girl still suspended in air. There's your ghost. They're all frosts, charlatans, cheats. Exterior, alley behind the brick house holding the seance. Night. A muddy alley runs across the back of tightly packed brick houses. A solitary gas lamp provides the only illumination. Everything is wet and steamy from a summer rain. Nigel stumbles out of the sales house and knocks over a metal trash can. He lurches into the alley and puts a hand on a brick wall to steady himself. In the open doorway appears the medium's three assistants. The skinny one jumps out. There he is. Let's get him! They race forward to attack. Just as the skinny assistant is about to grab him, Nigel whirls around and breaks his whiskey bottle over the young man's head. The guy crumples into the mud. Nigel brandishes the broken bottle at the other two. They spread out to come at Nigel from either side. From the seance house emerge two smartly dressed, attractive women, Annabelle Douglas, 28, and Sarah Bradbury, 18. Annabelle waves a gloved hand and speaks with authority. Stop. Right this instant. The burly thugs glance at the women and chuckle. They resume pressing in on Nigel from either side. Rapid footfalls signal the arrival of Edgar Gilpin, 26, from one end of the alley. The faint lamplight reveals that he is a slim, well-dressed African-American man. Edgar removes his jacket and throws it to Sarah. He rolls up his sleeves and taps Burley assistant number two's shoulder. You hurt the lady. Burley assistant number two attempts to punch Edgar, who blocks the blow, then slams his fist into the assailant's face. Early assistant number two shakes his head clear, then charges at Edgar. Edgar delivers a series of blows, neatly avoiding all counterpunches. He holds his fists up before him in the bare fist of boxing style of the day. Early assistant number one pulls out a large knife. 
He lunges at Nigel, who swings the broken bottle clumsily in defense. A gun fires. Annabelle levels her pistol at Burley assistant number one. I suggest you leave before you become a candidate for the next seance. Burley assistant number one holds up his free hand and backs away. After a few steps, he turns and runs down the muddy alley. Annabelle swings the pistol at Burley assistant number two. You too. Burley assistant number two's face is swollen and covered in small cuts. He looks grateful for the chance to escape. He helps the skinny assistant to his feet and the two hobble away. Edgar looks fresh and unhurt. He retrieves his jacket from Sarah, nodding his thanks. Nigel stares at the three of them. Who the hell are you? Annabelle drops the pistol into her purse and removes a business card. She offers it to Nigel, who ignores it. We are Adola, a group working for the Society for Psychical Research. Nigel scoffs. Claptrap, you're no better than those Cretans I just vanquished. Nigel tosses the broken bottle aside. He turns away from Annabelle and moves to go, passing Edgar and Sarah. Edgar grabs Nigel's arm. Hey, now. We just risked our lives. Nigel swings his arm free and grabs Edgar's arm and twists it behind the man's back. Pain flashes across Edgar's face. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Nigel sticks his face up to Edgar's. But if you ever lay a hand on me again, I'll break it clean off. Nigel turns to go, but Edgar taps him on the shoulder. Mr. Pickford. Nigel freezes. How the hell does this nigger know my name? Nigel whirls around, swinging his fist in a roundhouse punch. Edgar ducks the blow, then delivers a powerful punch to Nigel's chin. Nigel stumbles into a brick wall, then slides down to collapse in the mud, unconscious. Annabelle turns to Sarah. You said he would be difficult. He'll come around eventually. Annabelle sighs in resignation. Well, let's get him cleaned up. He smells like an outhouse. Interior, William James Psychology Laboratory, Harvard, Day. Professor William James, 41, bearded with a receding hairline, and several assistants are in the midst of an experiment with a man suspended in a metal cage. The man in the cage is bound to a chair, blindfolded, and his ears plugged with stoppers, oblivious to everything. All the men wear suits and ties, but James also wears a white lab coat. Various musical instruments, a drum, a xylophone, a triangle, etc., sit on a table next to the researchers. Professor James and the assistants watch the test subject in silence. After a few minutes, the man in the cage, whose forms are free, tentatively raises his right hand. James checks the time and records it on the clipboard. He looks at the others. As you can see, when deprived of stimuli, the brain begins to hallucinate. All five subjects have exhibited the same phenomenon. They think they hear something. James and his assistant are startled when across the room, Sarah throws open the laboratory door and holds it wide. Annabelle and Edgar enter, propping up Nigel Pickford, washed, clean-shaven and handsome, but totally drunk. Nigel is loudly singing, My Wild Irish Rose. William James taps a fountain pen on the pages of his clipboard as he approaches the intruders. Well, what have we here? Annabelle smiles with embarrassment. Sorry, Professor. He caught hold of some whiskey on the train. Why well, bring him in here in this condition? It would be fruitless to speak to him now. Nigel breaks free and stumbles across the room into the suspended cage. The contraption begins to sway to and fro. Sorry, madame. The cage swings back and knocks Nigel off his feet. Hey, I said I was sorry. Annabelle and Edgar retrieve Nigel, who resumes singing. If you want him sober, keep him under lock and key. He's completely incorrigible. I prefer to think no one is beyond hope. Nevertheless... He motions them to bring Nigel across the room, where James opens the door. We do need to help him achieve a more rational state. Annabelle and Edgar shove Nigel into a closet. James slams the door and locks it. Though muffled, Nigel's singing continues. James turns to the lab assistants. That's it for today, gentlemen. Let's reconvene at 9 a.m. tomorrow. They nod release the subject from the contraption, and depart. James cocks his head toward the closet door and smiles at the others. He seems happy enough in there. The professor ushers them towards the exit. They file out the door, and James pulls it shut behind him. Nigel's singing goes on for a few minutes and then stops abruptly. The closet door rattles. Hey, you folks can let me in now. The door rattles again. Hey, I gotta pee. Interior, 
William James Psychology Laboratory, Harvard, Eden. James approaches the closet door holding a wicker wrapped thermos and a metal cup. Long shadows now fill the room. He unlocks the door. Inside, Nigel sits on a small upturned crate. A wet stain is evident on a pile of books lying on the floor. Good God, man, you urinated over my books. I've been held captive for hours. Is this a sample of Yankee hospitality? I suppose it wouldn't be helped. Come, we haven't a moment to lose. Interior, carriage, evening. Though jostled by the carriage's progress, Professor James pours coffee into a metal cup and offers it to Nigel. What in Sam Hill is going on? Go ahead and drink. It's god-awful. My wife's one weakness, but it'll have to do. Nigel takes the cup as the carriage bounces, spilling coffee in his lap. Jesus! Nigel reflexively stands, but bumps his head on the carriage roof. The cup clatters to the floor, and Nigel falls back into his seat. I told you it was bad. Perhaps you'd like some later. The professor puts the thermos aside. He regards Nigel with a penetrating stare. Nigel squirms. So, Mr. Pickford, let me tell you what we're about. Exterior, train station, evening. The carriage pulls up before Annabelle, Edgar, and Sarah, who are paying porters to take numerous pieces of luggage and two large wooden crates onto the train. Nigel steps out of the carriage and holds the door open for Professor James. James shakes his head, no. I must return to Harvard. The Idola project is a passionate sideline, but my other work pays the bills. Thank you for agreeing to give us a try. The hell if you fruitcakes want to keep buying me whiskey and new clothes, I'm prepared to give you a whole week. Annabelle waves her hand back and forth to interdict. No alcohol. Nigel turns to William James in protest, but the professor shrugs. I agree. Annabelle and Nigel glare at each other in a test of wills. Finally, Nigel breaks off and glances down at his clothes. He gives the lapels of his new suit a strong tug. Well, all right. Fine, I'll leave you in capable hands. Nigel turns back to Annabelle and grins lecherously. If Annie's capable, I will. All right, the train is about to depart. I'll join you in a few days. Interior, train cabin, evening. Annabelle enters the cabin, followed by Nigel, Sarah, and Edgar. Nigel plops down next to Annabelle, but the moment Edgar enters, Nigel bounds back up. Go sit with the other jungle bunnies. Nigel fumes, but Annabelle steps before him. Mr. Pickford, this boorish behavior must stop. Edgar is a valuable member of this team. Sarah and Edgar turn and wordlessly leave the cabin. Of all the goddamn nerve. Exactly. Massachusetts integrated its trains years ago. It is you whose behavior is intolerable. They sit, but on opposite bench seats. Annabelle folds her arms and shakes her head with disgust. Really? Nigel folds his arms and leans back, mocking her. Really? Annabelle's face flushes with rage. If Sarah wasn't so adamant that we need you, I would shoot you right now. Nigel slides further down in his seat, leans into a corner and shuts his eyes. He speaks with nonchalance. Really? Flashback. Exterior. Battle of Fort Stedman, Civil War, 1865, night. Title. Battle of Fort Stedman, 18 years earlier. A young Lieutenant Nigel Pickford sits astride his horse in the woods. Below him stand a ragged band of anxious Confederate soldiers. Gunfire sounds in the distance. Flickering light from a burning structure some ways off faintly illuminates the men. Nigel raises his arm to signal the attack, then stops. In a panic, he glances back and forth at his men, who have suddenly become horribly disfigured. A young soldier, 17, cries while trying to hold in gusts that spill from his abdomen. He looks up in anguish. Why'd you let us die, Lieutenant? A corporal with half his skull gone steps forward. His glistening brain pulsates in the flickering light. It's a trap, sir. Interior, train cabin, 1883, present day, night. Brakes squeal as the train pulls into the Nantucket ferry station. The cabin jostles back and forth as the train slows. Nigel jerks awake and sits up suddenly. He is covered in sweat. Annabelle, Sarah, and Edgar stare at him from the opposite bench seat. You're dreaming of the war again. What? How? Come, Edgar. Let's see, see to the luggage. Edgar and Sarah depart. Nigel loosens his tie and puts a palm over each eye for a moment. He lowers his hands and looks at Annabelle. I need a drink. No, you don't. Your dipsomania is a result of not knowing how to handle your visions. Didn't the professor discuss this with you? He said this group would help me come to terms. He called it a gift. I call it a curse. 
Annabelle stands and offers him a hand. We need to transfer to the ferry. What have I got myself into? You hid in a bottle for almost 20 years. What did that get you? Nigel smiles grimly and takes Annabelle's gloved hand. <coughs> Interior, Nantucket Ferry, night. Annabelle and Nigel sit next to a window showing moonlight on the choppy water. A persistent low hum and vibration pervades the passenger deck due to the steam engine below. Sarah and Edgar walk down an aisle and head out a door onto the outer deck. So you go gallivanting around the country hunting ghosts. Mostly exposing frauds, like you, though not in a drunken stupor. We are convinced something is out there. It needs science to bring it to life. Why do you do it? I've been looking for one that isn't a fraud. Well, you found it. You? Goodness, no. Though I sometimes wish. It's Sarah. Sarah's parents sold it to a carnival when she was nine. She escaped last year and presented herself to the professor during one of his classes. She's certainly the most talented of us. She told us about you. Told you what? That you were gifted but tortured soul. There is a sudden jerk and the sound of engines stopping. Sarah runs in from the outer deck. Someone's drowned. Nigel, Annabelle, and Sarah join Edgar and the other passengers crowding the outer deck and promenade. The naked body of a man floats face down in the sea. From a lower deck, several crew members with gaffing hooks lean out. Another crew member holds a lantern at the end of a long pole just above the corpse. One hook snags the body, turning it over. The lamplight reveals that the man's throat has been torn open. The crowd makes sounds of revulsion and various comments about sharks. Nigel takes Annabelle's arm and turns her away. The lady should not subject herself to such indecencies. Annabelle frees herself and turns back to look. Two other crew members sink their hooks into the bloated body. As they haul it up along the barnacle-crusted side of the ship, the head detaches and splashes back into the water. A woman in the crowd screams, and the rest of the throng erupts into various shocked comments and opinions. The head, its mouth agape, sinks below the surface. My God! Annabelle turns to Sarah. Any thoughts? Sarah shakes her head. Edgar? Sharks? Annabelle turns back to Nigel, who in a fugue state stares down the promenade. The same headless corpse being hauled up from the water stands on the walkway, swaying slightly, dripping wet. It raises a lifeless arm and points at Nigel. Annabelle touches Nigel's shoulder. The vision disappears. Nigel? I don't believe I'll be playing in the surf anytime soon. Fade out. End of Act 1. Act 2. Fade in. Exterior Nantucket Ferry Landing. Night. Through wisps of fog, the ferry lowers its ramp. People stream forward and are directed to the side of the dock so wagons and horses can also disembark. When passengers approach the terminal building, people come out to greet them. The decapitated corpse becomes an immediate topic of conversation. A boy's voice carries above the rest. And the guy's head came clean off! The last to disembark are Annabelle, Sarah, Nigel, and Edgar, leading a couple of husky ferry workers who are pulling a large flatbed cart loaded with the group's belongings. They stop at the terminal building, which now appears deserted. That's as far as she goes. All right, and us too. The ferry workers look at Annabelle and the others. You can leave the cart next to the building when your people show. Edgar removes two silver dollars from his vest pocket and hands one to each of the ferry workers. Thank you for your pains, gentlemen. The man looked at the coins with surprise. Who knew that picking cotton paid so well? Both ferry workers burst out laughing and head back to the boat. Edgar balls his hands into fists. He takes a deep breath. It appears Yankees are boorish too. A slender, mousy woman, Leonor Hutchinson, 30, approaches them through the thickening fog. She walks with quick steps, furtively glancing this way and that, clutching her purse to her bosom like a shield. Lenore wears a long coat and wide-brimmed hat tied with fabric to her chin. A pair of dark glasses obscure her eyes. She speaks tentatively. Are you the associates of Professor James? A sudden gust of wind buffets the group and knocks Lenore's hat from her head. The hat tumbles across the dock. Nigel sprints and rescues us. Perhaps we should speak inside. The group moves into the empty waiting room of the ferry terminal and composes themselves, smoothing hair and clothing. The room's light reveals Lenore's abnormally pale skin. Her hair, in a severe bun, is pure white. While exotically attractive, 
her timid affect detracts from any allure. Nigel enters last and hands the hat to Lenore with a bow. Nigel Pickford, at your service. Lenore Hutchinson. They shake hands, and the touch lasts several weeks longer than one might expect. Much obliged. You are the perfect southern gentleman, Mr. Pickford. Lenore disengages her hand from Nigel's. She glances at each member of the group and smiles nervously. Please forgive my tardiness. I was hiring a wagon and arranging rooms for us at the Nantucket Inn. Annabelle steps forward and shakes Lenore's hand. Annabelle Douglas. She gestures at the others. We would like to proceed directly to your house. I was hoping to stay in town, a welcome reprieve from what I have been dealing with. Annabelle shakes her head. This is not a holiday, and the prospect of an authentic haunting is tremendously exciting. We'd like to get started. Very well. Interior, Hutchinson House, foyer, night. The ladies set their luggage down on the large marble floor next to a wooden crate. Edgar and Nigel come through the doorway, wiping their hands on handkerchiefs. What the hell are you keeping in the other crate, bricks? The device I expect will prove useful. The cook lives elsewhere and has gone for the night. I'll see what I can manage in the kitchen. Interior, dining room, night. Remnants of a light meal are scattered on one end of a long table. In front of every room at Nigel are crystal glasses of red wine. Nigel has water. Nigel grabs Edgar's half-full glass. Edgar slams his fist down on the table, but Sarah puts a hand over his and shakes her head to calm him. Nigel downs the wine and reaches for the bottle in front of Annabelle, but she snatches it away. She and Nigel silently lock horns for a moment before Nigel dismisses the situation with a grunt. He turns to Lenore. I may seem intemperate for asking, but why are you wearing dark spectacles at this hour? Lenore nervously touches her glasses and fusses with her hair and dress. She pauses, takes a deep breath, and then briefly removes her glasses to reveal that her eyes are bright red. She replaces the spectacles and stands. <laughs> Forgive my awkward attempt at vanity. Lenore turns away from the table, but Nigel grabs her arm. I was rude. Please forgive me. Sit. Lenore regards him for a moment through her dark glasses, gives a little nod, and retakes her chair. There is an awkward moment of silence before Annabelle changes the topic. Sarah thinks the gust of wind on the dock was no accident. Mr. Pickford, did you sense anything? No. You don't have much to offer, do you? Nigel looks slighted. I propose we conduct a seance before we turn in. Perhaps we can make contact right away. Edgar turns to Lenore. Have you a pry bar or a hammer? For a seance? The crate in your foyer contains a camera to capture sightings. I'll see what I can find. Then you will need to excuse me. A seance goes against my faith. I will allow it if you feel it is necessary. But you cannot expect me to participate. Interior, dining hall, later. The table is clear, aside from a kerosene lamp turned low. Sarah sits at the table's head, eyes closed, breathing raggedly. Annabelle, Edgar, and Nigel have palms resting on the table. Next to Edgar is a red rubber bulb on a hose that snakes off the table to a camera with a tripod. Above the camera is a narrow pan filled with flash powder. Sarah gasps and lurches back into her chair with eyes wide. She closes her eyes and begins to gag. From her mouth issues a pulsing mouth of translucent green slime that floats above the table. Edgar grabs the camera bulb and squeezes. At the flash of the powder, the slime immediately darts back down Sarah's gullet. No more photographs! What? Annabelle shoots him an icy stare. Edgar nods. Sarah resumes the ragged breathing in her trance. She moans and sobs as though racked with pain. Who are you? With whom am I speaking? Sarah's moans cease, but pain is evident as she speaks in a chorus of voices, male and female, children and adults. We are many. Nigel is uncomfortable. He glances at the others who are fascinated. Why do you haunt this house? Sarah moans in pain, then takes a horse breath and stands, shouting with many voices. Leave! Get out! Not until we understand why you are here and help you to. Sarah turns away and slowly walks from the room. The men look at Annabelle for guidance, and she motions to follow. The three trail Sarah through the house and out the front door. Exterior, grounds outside the Hutchison house, night. A strong breeze whips bands of mist around them in the faint light. Far off is the sound of pounding surf. They follow Sarah to the rear of the house and across a lawn. She stops, stretches out an arm, and points. 
Nigel shakes his head in frustration. But there's nothing to see in this darkness. What do you want to show us? Sarah emphatically points, but does not speak. You want us to go in that direction? That must be it. Annabelle, Edgar, and Nigel edge forward in the dark. Lenore appears before them. Stop! Lenore lifts the shutter of a blackout lantern and shows them that in a few feet is a practice. My gosh, she nearly sent us off a cliff. What are you doing here? I needed to get away from your sacrilege. I thought you were scientists. Why would Sarah send us to our deaths? I don't know. I'm sure perhaps the devil had a hand in it. Let's ask her. They turn and see Sarah collapsed on the ground, unconscious. Interior, hallway outside Sarah's bedroom, later. Nigel and Edgar are standing in the hall, waiting in silence. Edgar glances at Nigel, who rolls his eyes and turns away from Edgar as he leans against the wall. Sarah's door opens, and Annabelle and Lenore emerge from the room. Sarah is briefly viewed sleeping on the door before Annabelle shuts the door. Thank you for carrying Sarah upstairs. She seems to be sleeping peacefully. I shouldn't wonder. Nearly killing us would tire anyone out. There is an awkward silence. Yes. Well, perhaps we should all get some rest. Edgar yawns. Home for that. I'm done in. Annabelle crosses to her room and opens the door. She turns back to the others. An auspicious start, in any case. It appears the home is truly haunted. I hope none of you are troubled further this evening. Thank you for coming. Lenore smiles nervously and catches Nigel's eye. He smirks. Wouldn't miss this for the world. Interior, Annabelle's room, night. Annabelle has changed into a white cotton gown and a gingham robe. She is unpacking items from her bag. She removes a tortoiseshell hairbrush and comb and sets them on the bureau. She next removes a small, gilt-edged folding picture frame and opens it. Two sepia-colored pictures are inside, an older man on one side and an older woman on the other. Annabelle crosses the room and sets the frame on the bedside table next to the kerosene lamp. She moves to go, then turns back. Annabelle retrieves the picture frame and sits on the bed. She looks intently at the photos, stroking the picture of the woman with her thumb. A tear forms in one eye. Annabelle. Annabelle stands and swipes away the tear. She looks around nervously. Mother? Get out! The door to Annabelle's room flies open and bangs against the bedroom wall. No one is in the doorway. Interior, Hutchison House Library, moments later. From the open door to the library, Nigel sees Annabelle in her robe descend the stairs and enter the library to join him. Nigel stands next to a large bookshelf filled with leather-clad volumes. The room has a settee and several similarly upholstered English Regency-styled club chairs. A lamp with an amber-colored globe bathes the room in a sickly yellow light. Can't sleep? No. Me neither, but with me it's a matter of choice. Nigel picks up a volume off the shelf and blows a cloud of dust off the top of the book. Despite a library, it seems our hostess is not much of a reader. And you? Used to be. Was quite a bookworm before the war. Was a lot of things. What happened? Sarah has only hinted at some crisis. Nigel raises the book and reads from the spine. Moby Dick. He looks at Annabelle. A man haunted by a whale. Seems appropriate. Annabelle reaches out and touches his arm. Nigel stops, looks down at her hand, and then into her eyes. He grins. This is a capable hand you're offering me, Annie? Does it come with the rest? Annabelle jerks her hand away. It's just that I'm trying to understand... I know why I'm here. It beats sleeping under a bridge. Why are you here? You looking for your mama? I heard you calling for her when I was coming down the stairs. Annabelle's face reddens. You don't understand. Some of the best minds of our time support our cause. Clergymen, scientists, politicians, writers, even Samuel Clements. I don't think any of them will find their mama here. How do you explain tonight's seance? I can't. Not yet, anyway. Perhaps I'll take my time and enjoy clean sheets for a while. You know, I could use a little help taking the chill off them sheets. You disgust me. That makes two of us. Nigel leaves the library and ascends the staircase to his room. Interior, Nigel's bedroom, night. A kerosene lamp shows Nigel sleeping fitfully, his face covered in sweat. His book lies open on his chest. Much of the room lurks in shadow. It's a trap, sir. Nigel jolts awake. He sits up and looks around in a panic. The book falls to the floor with a thump. 
Nigel lies back and looks at the swirling red design painted on the ceiling. The pattern transmogrifies into a mass of writhing, intertwined naked bodies. Faint moans and grunts of pleasure grow louder, then louder still. Rising above the rotting is a woman's piercing, ear-splitting scream. Nigel stands transfixed. Something dark drips from the ceiling onto his face. He wipes it and sees blood on his fingers. Nigel gasps and pushes off the bed. He struggles toward the door, swiping at his face and nightshirt as more drops fall. There is pounding on his locked door. Interior, upstairs hallway, night. Nigel throws his door wide and runs into Annabelle and Edgar. Lenore emerges from her room at the end of the hall, tying the cord to a white robe around her waist. Her long hair hangs free. She sees blood on Nigel and runs to him. You're hurt! Nigel regards his blood-spattered night clothes and then slowly shakes his head. Uh, no. The door stands open and Nigel turns back to look at his room. The bed clothes are in disarray, but there is no blood on the bed or anywhere else in his room. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Ectoplasmic manifestation. We need a sample. Edgar tries to wipe Nigel's face with a handkerchief, but Nigel grasps Edgar's arm. Keep your goddamn hands off me. Exterior, grounds outside the Hutchison house, evening. Fog still blankets the landscape as Nigel and Lenore walk together. In spite of the diffuse light and the lateness of the day, Lenore wears her smoked glasses, her wide room hat, long coat, and gloves. Is it always so foggy? It's starting to lift. The stars should be beautiful tonight. Lenore stops and turns to Nigel. About last night, I'm so sorry. Now, at least you can see what I'm up against. Lenore grasps his arm. Are you sure you're all right? Nigel nods and pats her hand. As they continue walking, Lenore slips her hand through the crook of his arm. I find it hard to believe your Miss Bradbury has no memory of nearly sending you all off a precipice. It's lucky I was there. Do you often go about in the dark? With my affliction, it's the only time I can move out freely. It must be difficult. One must play the cards when one is dealt. Nigel does a double take. What's wrong? Professor James used those very words. Because they're true. Perhaps you should take them to heart. They come to a small family cemetery. Lenore reaches down and pulls some weeds away from a tombstone, a joint marker. Mother passed in childbirth. Father two years ago from influenza. And there? Nigel indicates a plot of freshly turned earth but lacking a tombstone. My beloved dog, I have yet to receive the headstone. Once he was gone, the hauntings became much more intense. Lenore squeezes Nigel's arm and smiles. I guess I need a new protector. Interior, Hutchison House foyer, evening. Nigel enters the house alone and Annabelle crosses the foyer to confront him. She has to step around the open crate, toolbox, mallet, crowbar, packing straw, and all the splintered, broken wood that lies on the marble floor. Where have you been? What business is it of yours? We're here to investigate a haunting. She is a client. Don't make this something more. Honestly, I don't like her. She's peculiar. She can't help being albino. She's all alone and under tremendous stress. Perhaps you're jealous. Annabelle snorts derisively, turns away, and motions for Nigel to follow. We need you for another seance. So we can be led off a cliff, like lemmings, no thanks. Sarah convinced us to pick you out of the gutter and dress you up like the dandy you've become. She sees something in you that, frankly, I don't. Perhaps you can honor her faith in you, if nothing else. Nigel Grimaces starts to shake his head and then shrugs assent. Leon Macduff, or is it Lady Macbeth? Interior dining hall, night. As before, the group clusters around the end of a long table with a kerosene lamp set between them. The seance is already underway. Sarah struggles to breathe. Sarah lurches back in her chair, then relaxes. She opens her eyes, smiles, and licks her lips lasciviously. With whom am I speaking? You should know if you hired me. Sarah rises and saunters behind the seated Edgar. She runs her hands through his hair and smiles at the rest of them. I didn't realize you were serving dark meat at this party. Edgar winces and shifts uncomfortably in his chair. Who are you? Sarah notices Nigel and comes up behind him. She leans over and rubs his chest, then starts to work her hands lower. In a husky voice, she whispers in Nigel's ear. You can call me Ruby. Nigel grins. Yes, ma'am. Abruptly, 
Sarah straightens up in alarm and glances around. Where am I? What's happening? Oh God, no, no. She screams and thrashes about, striking the back of Nigel's head. She drops to the floor, still screaming. Sarah's body jerks and her mouth foams in an epileptic fit. Interior, upstairs hallway, night. Lenore paces in the hall, wringing her hands in worry. Nigel, Edgar, and Annabelle file out of Sarah's room. How is she? The ether will give her a headache, but she'll be fine by morning. I wonder if having you here is really for the best. I know some Catholics. Perhaps they could help me get a priest. That would be a breach of contract. Annabelle starts toward her room, then turns back to Lenore. Despite considerable expense and distress, we've agreed to help you end this haunting instead of studying it. If Edgar is correct, your home should be free of spirits by this time tomorrow. Annabelle opens her bedroom door and looks back again at Lenore. How about some gratitude? She enters her room and slams the door. Interior, Sarah's room, night. A kerosene lamp casts faint light around a room similar to Nigel's, except that floral paper covers the walls, and a full-length mirror stands at one corner. Sarah sleeps on her side, facing away from the lamp. She stirs as the lamp becomes bright, her eyes open, and she turns over on the bed. Next to the lamp stands a young girl, Betsy, age nine, staring at Sarah. Betsy has a pretty face and wears a fancy dress. Her appearance is marred by a throat hideously torn open. Flaps of skin reveal bloody muscle tissue and pieces of veins and arteries that dangle beneath her pretty chin. Sarah struggles away on the bed, raising her hands to her face in horror. Fade out. End of Act 2. Act 3. Fade in. Interior, Sarah's room, moments later. Sarah backs off the bed and turns to flee, but the ghost materializes before her, crying and staring at her. My throat hurts. Sarah tries to edge around her, but the girl turns and pleads for help. Miss, please. Sarah stares at Betsy and her expression softens. Slowly, she opens her arms. The young girl runs to Sarah and hugs her, crying. Sarah strokes the back of Betsy's head. There, there, it's all right. Interior, upstairs hallway, night. Nigel bolts from his room, his face showing terror and covered in sweat. His rumpled attire indicates that he was sleeping in his clothes. He looks up and down the hall, empty. He paces before his door and glances back in. Nigel shakes his head and then moves towards the stairs. Interior, upstairs hallway, later. A very drunk Nigel staggers up the stairs with an open bottle of red wine. He takes a swig and wobbles, nearly falling backwards. Catching himself, he turns and salutes the stairs. Moving toward his room, he glances down the hall and then drops the bottle to the floor. Blood is seeping into the hall from under Lenore's door. Nigel runs down the hall and throws open Lenore's door. Lenore? Interior, Lenore's bedroom, night. Her room is deserted. The blood at his feet has disappeared. Lenore's bed is still made up but the heavy curtains covering the windows on the opposite wall have been pushed aside and the two halves of French doors stand open. Nigel runs onto the balcony. He sees the beach and roiling surf below the bluff. He also sees the white of the Norse bathroom and unbound hair blowing in the wind as she approaches the water. Panicked, Nigel shouts. Lenore! His voice is lost in the wind and pounding surf. He goes back in and grabs the lit kerosene lamp. Returning to the balcony, he descends the stairs to the yard below. Nigel makes his way along the edge of the cliff, holding the lamp high. He spots a trail and makes his way down. Exterior, beach below the Hutchison house, night. Nigel runs as best he can in the soft sand, shouting all the while. Lenore! Lenore! He stops to retrieve Lenore's rope from the sand. He looks up at the heavy surf. There is no sign of her. Exterior, beach below the Hutchison house, later. Nigel sits before a driftwood fire. The wind blows spectral shapes of smoke and burning embers into the night air. Nigel holds Lenore's robe and stares into the flames. Mr. Pickford, I would thank you to return my robe at once. Do not turn around, I'm not decent. Nigel's face registers both shock and relief. After a moment, he breaks into a grin. He lifts the robe with one hand and Lenore's bare arm extends from the darkness to grab him. Weren't you cold? Not until I emerged from my swim and discovered someone had absconded with my robe. Lenore, no longer naked, comes up behind Nigel. She is without her glasses. Strands of her white hair have dried and fly around her head in the breeze. She touches his shoulder. You were worried about me? 
Nigel stands and faces her. Weren't you worried about sharks? Lenora shakes her head. No. Nigel takes Lenora's arms and pulls her to him. You should be worried. They kiss passionately. Locked in an embrace, they sink to the sand. Interior upstairs hallway near dawn. Nigel emerges from Lenora's bedroom and shuts the door. He tiptoes down the hall to his room. Before entering, he notices the spilled bottle of wine and the red stain on the carpet. Nigel retrieves the bottle, tiptoes into his room, and shuts the door. Exterior, outside the Hutchison house, day. Nigel and Sarah emerge from the house and move to the edge of the porch. On the dirt drive, Edgar has opened the remaining crate, revealing a cast iron machine, pieces of a bicycle, and a large spool of copper wire. Sarah regards the machine with a frown. So this is the gizmo you spoke of. Edgar is distracted, hearing packing straw from the machine. He glances up at Nigel and shakes his head. Dynamo. Huh? Not gizmo, dynamo. This, whatchamacallit, is supposed to kill ghosts? No, no. Don't be absurd. Well, then what good is it? Exasperated, Edgar stands and brushes straw from his clothes. Ghosts, by definition, are already dead. I'm going to neutralize them. Edgar bats away flecks of straw from the machine with a handkerchief. All life has energy, even spirits. In fact, that's all they are. I'm going to surround this house with a powerful charge, like a giant electromagnet. The spirits will not be able to resist. Then I'm going to ground them, just like a lightning rod dissipates a charge into the earth. So you're sending them straight to hell. What does hell have to do? Well, don't get all uppity. Edgar throws his handkerchief down and walks off in disgust. Sarah has been watching behind Nigel, and he turns to her. What did I say? He helped save your life in, in Atlanta. So I need to show him respect. That'll be a cold day in hell. Nigel walks off as Sarah picks up the crowbar lying next to the crate. She smashes it against the dynamo. Nigel grabs her from behind in a bear hug. Edgar runs up and snatches the crowbar away. What the blazes? You can't use this thing. They're not bad. We must help them. Nigel grins. Did some handsome gentleman ghost come to call? Sarah stomps her heel on Nigel's foot, and he releases her. She turns to confront him. You're impossible. Sarah looks at Edgar, who is shaking his head in dismay. What's gotten into you? We can free this house of its curse. Where spirits go after we're done is inconsequential. You're as impossible as he is. Somehow I expected more from you. Sarah runs back into the house. Interior upstairs hallway, day. Sarah ascends the stairs and runs down the hallway, calling all the while for Betsy. She opens the door to Nigel's room. Betsy? She runs to Annabelle's room and throws open the door. Betsy! Running to her room, she throws its door wide. Interior, Sarah's room, continuous. Betsy stands near the bed, staring at Sarah. Betsy, let me show you to the others. We will convince them not to destroy you. Betsy shakes her head. I'm not the one in danger. Betsy steps up to Sarah and takes her hand. Betsy leads Sarah through the full-length mirror, where they both disappear. Interior, Hutchinson House foyer, continuous. Annabelle enters the foyer from the dining room, just as Nigel and Edgar enter through the front door. Where's Sarah? I heard shouting. She went berserk and tried to destroy the dynamo. Fortunately, she didn't know what to strike. Nigel makes an unconcerned gesture and grins. She's taking a shine to a ghostly gentleman. Annabelle shakes her head. We must hurry. Annabelle races up the stairs, followed by the two men. Interior upstairs hallway continuous. Annabelle and the men run down the hallway, checking rooms as they go. They get to Sarah's and enter. Interior, Sarah's room continuous. Sarah? Annabelle steps up to the mirror. Nigel and Edgar follow. No, it can't be. Annabelle touches the solid surface of the mirror. On the other side, through a swirling gray fog is Sarah, screaming and reaching out for help, but unable to escape. Fade out, end of act three. Act four, Sarah's room moments later. Nigel wedges himself between Annabelle and the mirror and attempts to steer her away. Annie, step away. We don't want to lose you too. Stop. No, I'm serious. Step away. Don't move. Look at your right elbow. Nigel's elbow has disappeared into the mirror. He jerks it free. It is covered in gray slime, but is otherwise fine. Edgar comes up and touches the surface of the mirror. Solid. Remarkable. 
Well, Mr. Pickford, it appears you may be of some use after all. Interior, Sarah's room, moments later. Nigel is standing before the mirror without a jacket. A length of rope is tied around his waist, and the other end is held by Edgar and Annabelle. Would a tether help a lamb being led to the slaughter? You're the only one who can rescue her. Lucky me. Nigel steps into the mirror and disappears. Interior, mirror world, continuous. Thick gray fog swirls around Nigel in a gale that swallows his voice as he shouts. Sarah! Sarah! Sarah's voice sounds far away. Nigel! Nigel steps forward. The fog clears enough for him to see Sarah being buffeted by the wind. Surrounding them at a distance are the shadowy shapes of hundreds of people. Sarah, exhausted and emotionally distressed, collapses into Nigel's arms. She grabs at him weakly and croaks. She didn't realize I'd be trapped. Sarah glances at the shadowy figures surrounding them. They told me what's been happening. Oh God, I know. Sarah faints into Nigel's arms. Nigel tugs on the rope several times and then struggles back. Interior, Sarah's room, continuous. I see them, but the mirror has become solid. How can that be? The rope merges into the center of the mirror but does not budge. On the other side is a blurry view of Nigel carrying Sarah and panicked. Should I break it? No. They can be trapped forever. Interior, mirror world, continuous. Nigel, still carrying Sarah, batters one hand against the now solid mirror portal. With each strike of his hand, there is a loud boom. He kicks it, causing a still louder boom. Nigel looks at the blurry view of Annabelle and Edgar, then looks down at Sarah, unconscious in his arms. He takes a couple of steps back. Hang on, kid. He holds Sarah's head against his chest to protect her and charges at the mirror. Interior, Sarah's room, continuous. Nigel crashes through the mirror with Sarah in his arms. Edgar grabs them as they crash through, keeping them from falling onto the broken glass. Nigel and Sarah are covered in gray slime but have no apparent injuries. The front of Edgar is covered with gray slime too after assisting them. There's that sample of ectoplasm you wanted. Exterior, outside the Hutchinson house, day. Nigel exits the front door, cleaned up but disheveled. He squints and shields his eyes from the afternoon sun. Edgar has changed his clothes and is back at work on the dynamo. Hearing Nigel emerge from the house, he cocks his chin up and down as a hello, and then returns to his work. Nigel steps across the porch and places his foot over a wrench. Where are the others? Edgar sets down a screwdriver and begins moving around the machine for the wrench. Sarah awoke in a dither. She and Annabelle have gone to meet the professor. As for Miss Hutchinson, I haven't seen her all day. Sarah insists you stay away from her. She was screaming nonsense. Blast it all. Where did I put it? Nigel is amused at Edgar's growing frustration. Could breaking the mirror have ended the haunting? Sarah says no. It seems my gizmo is our best shot. Have you seen... Nigel lifts his foot, revealing the wrench. <coughs> Edgar is ready to kill. Instead, he shakes his head and takes a deep breath. Listen, I'm way behind and would appreciate your help. Would you hand me that wrench? Nigel kicks the tool. It skitters across the porch and lands in the dust at Edgar's feet. Thanks. Interior, Lenore's bedroom, day. Nigel enters the room and shuts the door behind him. The heavy curtains are drawn across the windows and French doors. The kerosene lamp near the bed does little to cut the gloom. Lenore? I'm here. Lenore steps out of a dark corner. She puts her hands on either side of his face and draws him to her. They kiss. I can't stop thinking of you. As it should be. They kiss again and fall onto the bed. Exterior, Nantucket Ferry Landing, evening. The sky burns red with the setting sun as passengers and wagons disembark from the ferry. Among them is William James, carrying a leather satchel. Annabelle and Sarah step out of the terminal and run to meet the professor. Sarah grabs his arm and cries, It's worse than we realized. Exterior, outside the Hutchinson house, evening. The sky is even more crimson. The sun, a fiery red ball, hangs just above the horizon. Edgar steps back from the machine, wiping grease from his hands with a rag. From one end of the dynamo extends a long bicycle chain attached to a stationary bicycle. From the other end runs a strand of copper wire that wraps around the house several times. Interior, Lenore's bedroom. Nigel and Lenore lie naked in bed together. I don't know when Edgar will have that thing working, but we should leave the house. It might be dangerous. You're right. 
You should go. We should go. <laughs> of course. Interior, Hutchinson House, foyer, evening. Nigel and Lenore are dressed. Nigel opens the front door and is bathed in the crimson light. Lenore pushes the door shut and puts a hand on Nigel's cheek. I'll join you outside in a moment, dear heart. In case the house gets damaged, I want to grab a few mementos. Exterior, outside the Hutchinson house, evening. Nigel leaves the house and sees Edgar regarding his completed machine. Coming up the drive is a black carriage. Nigel crosses the porch and is stuck below strands of copper wire to escape. The carriage pulls up and Professor James, Annabelle, and Sarah get out. You're just in time. Edgar dons a pair of black elbow-length rubber gloves and places a set of goggles over his head. Professor James crosses to Nigel and shakes his head. Behind Nigel, Edgar climbs onto the bicycle and begins pedaling. I understand you saved our Sarah's life. I can't tell you how grateful we are you joined our troop. Nigel looks embarrassed. About that, I've decided to stay, but I want to thank you all for rescuing me from the streets and giving me back my life, one I had all but lost. It's working. Nigel turns and sees Edgar pedaling maniacally and the house enveloped in a blue electrical hue. Electric crackling sounds fill the air. My God, I knew it! Panic flashes across Nigel's face as he glances around. Where's Lenore? Edgar looks left and right. Now he appears worried, but he continues to pedal. I thought she was with you. Nigel charges toward the house, but Annabelle grabs his arm. It isn't safe! To hell with that! Nigel shakes his arm free and runs to the porch. He is thrown back through the air by the electrical charge. Nigel lands on the dirt driveway. He struggles to his feet and shakes his head clear, and then stumbles toward the house. Annabelle turns to Edgar. Stop! Edgar tears off his goggles. I have. It's continuing on its own. The house continues to crackle and glow with the blue current. Nigel grabs a board from the packing crate and uses it to strike the wires barring his way, beating at them like a madman. Finally, the wires break and the blue current disappears. Sarah closes her eyes and holds her right palm toward the house. She looks up at the others. They're gone. All of them. The house is clear. Nigel staggers into the house. Interior, Hutchinson House foyer, night. Nigel staggers into the foyer and screams. Lenore! Interior, upstairs hallway, night. Tripping in his haste, Nigel runs clumsily down the hall, continuing to scream. Lenore! Interior, Lenore's bedroom, night. Nigel throws open the door and calls out, his voice now hoarse. Lenore! Lenore, naked, stands with her back to him. The curtains are drawn and she stares out the open French doors at the glowing red horizon. The sun has fully set. Her unbound hair rides Medusa-like around her head in the breeze. Thank God you're all right. I don't think God had much to do with it. Nigel comes up from behind and cups her breasts. She turns and they kiss with intensity. They part, regard each other for a moment, then embrace again. Lenora nuzzles his neck. Nigel leads her towards the bed. The ghosts, they're gone. They're free. I know. Lenore pushes him backward onto the bed and climbs on top, straddling him and pinning his arms down. Her smile is hungry. Her red eyes begin to glow. It's incredibly inconvenient when my victims come back to haunt me. Lenore's eyes become fiery coals, and fangs reveal themselves as her smile becomes a snarl. A stringy drop of saliva falls from her mouth and lands on Nigel's cheeks. Lenore slurps her saliva back and licks her lips. Nigel jerks his head back and forth, struggling to get free, but he can't. No! Lenore bends down for Nigel's throat and is about to bite when the door bursts open and Professor James and Edgar rush into the room. Remember! Through the heart! Edgar gives a yell and charges at Lenore with a sharpened spear of wood from the shipping crate. Annabelle and Sarah arrive at the doorway. They both gasp. Lenore turns and bats Edgar in the spear aside. Edgar drops the spear as Lenore springs from the bed and lands on him, forcing him backwards onto the floor. Lenore, on top of Edgar, looks up at the others in the doorway and growls. She leans down, fangs bared to tear at Edgar's throat, then jolts back with an almost orgasmic gasp. Harder! Push harder, man! Nigel grunts with the effort as the sharpened piece of wood emerges from just below Lenore's left breast. Lenore screams and her back arches in pain. Her eyes fade and roll back into her head. She collapses forward, threatening to impale Edgar, 
but Nigel grabs her and twists her away in a final macabre embrace. Nigel looks at Lenore in his arms, dead, but no longer a vampire. He then looks at Edgar. Edgar struggles to his knees and rubs his throat. He gives a nod of thanks. Nigel drops Lenore to the floor, regards his bloody hands, and howls. No! Fade out. End of Act 4. Act 5. Fade in. Interior dining hall. Morning. Nigel and the police officer are concluding an interview. The officer's round helmet is resting on the table beside his small notebook. The officer closes his notebook and puts it and the pencil in his uniform's breast pocket. He stands and retrieves his helmet. On the other side of the table, Nigel stands too. Uh, that should do it, uh, sir. An incredible story, if I uh, do say so, but, but uh, you're all telling me the same tale, and all the bodies uh, we've been digging up uh, speak for themselves in a manner of speaking. What bodies? Her parents? Uh, the dog? Uh, you are uh, Miss uh, Bradbury. Uh, showed us where to dig. Uh, bodies were stacked up like cordwood, in a manner of speaking, uh, where Miss Hutchison told you she had buried a dog. All of them with uh, terrible neck wounds, uh, the same wounds we've been seeing on the bodies of fishermen washing the shore for years. Uh, you're lucky to be alive. I need air. Nigel bolts out the door. In the foyer are two more policemen. Nigel runs outside. <coughs> Dazed, he goes to the edge of the porch and sits. He puts his head in his hands and begins to cry. You all right? Embarrassed, Nigel wipes away his tears and looks up. He sees Edgar, dirty and sweaty, sitting next to him. Edgar holds his shovel up like a scepter. In the distance, policemen are still digging in the family plot. A pair of officers lay a draped body next to a dozen more set out in the driveway. In a manner of speaking, what now? Either get drunk or start making amends. Nigel leaves his shoulders into a deep sigh. He looks at Edgar. I owe you an apology. You tried to save my life? Twice. I've been wrong about a lot of things. Can I quote you? Nigel cranes his neck around to see Annabelle, Sarah, and Professor James standing behind him on the porch. Nigel stands and faces them all. I'm hoping you have uh, reconsidered leaving our group. I don't seem to be much good at anything. You rescued me. Sarah goes to Nigel and hugs him. I don't know. None of us do. That is what we are about, to shine the light of science on what has been hidden, feared, or misunderstood. I want you to be part of this. Uh, I don't know what to say. Well, then we'll speak no more of resigning. Welcome back. Nigel, grinning ruefully, reaches around Sarah, who is still hugging him to shake the professor's hand. After a well-deserved respite, our next case is in St. Petersburg, Virginia near the Fort Stedman battlefield, a place where I believe you have some familiarity. Nigel's smile evaporates. Fade out. The end. <laughs>